Tuesday, we learned about an experiment that was performed in 1897, kind of the beginnings, in the sense of modern physics. It changed the model of the atom drastically from what it was before. You remember, before 1897, we had the solid sphere model of the atom, the Dalton solid sphere model of the atom. Atoms are different, but they're not made up of anything. An atom is an atom. There's nothing smaller than an atom. In 1897, uh, who was it that discovered there is something smaller than an atom? Thompson, yeah. And what was it that he discovered? Yeah, he discovered the electron. Now, he used something called a cathode ray tube, or sometimes we just abbreviate that as a CRT, to discover the electron. And a cathode ray tube had been around for, I don't know, 40, 50 years prior to that. It had been in existence for a long time. People used them for all kinds of purposes. People observed this, this beam of something traveling from one end to the other end. They called them cathode rays because nobody really knew what they were. People had hypotheses on what they were. Some people said, well, they're probably electromagnetic radiation. Some people said, that's probably particles. Some people even said maybe that it's charged particles, but nobody really established what these cathode rays were until Thompson in 1897. Here's the cathode ray tube. It's an evacuated glass tube. It means all the air is sucked out of it. It's got two terminals, a negative terminal right here, the negative terminal, you can tell it's negative because it's closest to the negative side of the power supply. And then we've got the positive terminal over here. We know that it's positive because it's closest to the positive side of the power supply. What's the name that we assign to the negative terminal here in this cathode ray tube? Yes, Patrick? Cathode. Excellent. If you're if you taking chemistry, that's a little bit confusing. We just got to get past that and remember that the negative terminal is the cathode. These mysterious cathode rays left the cathode. They went through a hole in this other terminal that we call the anode. And then they just keep going. We know where they strike the screen because this screen is coated with this, this phosphorescent paint that glows when the cathode ray strikes it. So we know exactly where they strike. That's why one of the old style TVs uh, shows a picture, right? Is this cathode ray, literally this, as we now know, the beams of electrons, hits various spots on the television screen, which causes the television screen to glow and creates the image of uh, what we're trying to observe. Now, Thompson looked at this and said, I want to know something about this. He, like, he didn't set out to discover the electron, per se. He set out to, dis to discover what it is that these cathode rays were. And it just so happened that they turned out to be electrons. Um, the first thing he did in order to determine what these things were, were to introduce a magnetic field over here. Over here in what I now call the main chamber. It's not an official name for it, it's just what I call it, the main chamber. Magnetic field causes these cathode rays to do what? To deflect, yeah, they change the path, they deflect. The deflection is going to look something like this. What's the shape of that called? Not a parabola. It's not a parabola. You get two choices, a parabola and a... If it was going through an electric field, that would be a parabola. But a magnetic field, it would be a, it's a circle, yeah. And Thompson knew this. He knew this. Charged particles going in a circle in a magnetic, he knew they were charged particles now, right? Because that's what charged particles do in a magnetic field, is go in a circle. He knew they were charged particles. In fact, at this point, he knew they were negatively charged particles because of the deflection rule, right? Thumb, direction of the particle, fingers feel, palm points downward. They, they must be negatively charged particles in order to do that. He decided he was going to do an analysis on this to determine some of the properties of these, what they, what they were called cathode rays. Now we know they're negatively charged particles. He wanted to know more about these negatively charged particles. So he said Fc equal to Fm. You guys remember the equation for Fc? We've used that a bunch of times, although it's been a little while. Fc is? Good. Don't make it mv squared over r squared. Don't make it one-half mv squared over R. 
Okay, it sounds silly to make it one half mv squared over r, but you can see how that confusion could come about, right? It's test day. You're 70 minutes into your test. Your mind is all kind of mush. And then you remember kind of mv squared over r, and you remember kind of one half mv squared, and then you kind of combine the equations, and that's what you end up getting. It should be mv squared over r. The magnetic force is QVB. Cancel one of the Vs. We're left with MV over R is equal to Q times B. Thompson knew what R was. He knew what R was because he knew where they struck the screen because the screen glowed where they struck. So he was able to measure R, the radius of the path, fairly easily. He also knew what B was because, listen, if, you, if you're the guy who introduces the magnetic field, you get to determine what B is. So he knew the value of B. He didn't know what M was. He didn't know what V was. He didn't know what Q was. Three variables he didn't know. So what did he do? What comes next? Yeah. Good. He introduced an electric field right here caused by two plates, positive and negative. Okay, that causes these cathode rays to experience an electric force upwards. And then he introduced a magnetic field in there, as Venture just said. That would cause a thumb, fingers, palm, a magnetic force downwards. We call this the velocity selection chamber. I sometimes call it the Goldilocks chamber. Why the Goldilocks chamber? Well, because some of the particles are moving too fast. And for those particles, they end up curving downwards. The path ends up curving downwards like this. We don't care about those particles. Some of the particles are going too slow. Those ones end up curving upwards like this. I don't care about those ones. I care about the particles that are going at just the right speed, hence the Goldilocks chamber. The particles that are going at just the right speed go straight through. And if they go straight through, what do we know about that electric and magnetic force? If they go straight through, undeflected, we know that those, yeah, they have to be equal to each other. Fe equals Fm. Just as a little aside here before we go further with that, why do we not take into account gravity here? Gravity's there. Why do we not take it into account? If you were to, go ahead. Yeah, we're talking about individual, as we now know them. Remember, Thompson didn't know this, but we now know they're electrons. The mass of an individual electron is so small that the force of gravity, it would be there, but it would be so small compared to the magnetic force and the electric force, it just wouldn't matter. Right? If you measured the speed to 10 significant digits, Gravity might matter. If you measure it to three or four significant digits, gravity is just not going to make any difference. Okay. So we, it's there, but we ignore it because it's ridiculously small. Remember we said back in Unit 2 when we did uh, electricity, we said gravity in the grand scheme of things is a really small force, right? The electrical force, the magnetic force are typically way bigger than the force of gravity. You guys remember the equation for Fe, the electric force? Yep, Q times E, good. Uh, some people will get that mixed with, mixed up with Q times V. QV is electric energy, QE is electric force. And then the magnetic force, of course, is QVB. We cancel out Qs, and we end up getting, if we rearrange it, uh, e, V is equal to E over B, which we can solve for and then sub into this. This, the main chamber. Because remember, these particles that we're analyzing right now went straight through and then entered the main chamber at that speed. Now, we know three of the five. We're left with not knowing Q, and we're left with not knowing M. So what did Thompson solve for? Couldn't solve for Q, couldn't solve for M, rather solve for Q over M. We call that the charge to mass ratio. Remember, ratio means the same thing as divide. Q divided by M, charge to mass ratio. Let's take the M down by dividing. 
we get V over R is equal to Q over M times B. Now let's take the B down by dividing. We get Q over M is equal to V over B times R. You don't need to remember that number, but you do need to remember that that number is really, really big. It's really, really big, which means, in fact, it's bigger than the charge to mass ratio of even the hydrogen atom, which is the smallest atom we have. And if the charge to mass ratio is bigger than that for hydrogen, then the mass must be smaller than that for hydrogen. And if the mass is smaller than the mass of the smallest atom, then these negatively charged particles that up until now we thought were just cathode rays, they must be subatomic. There's the discovery of the electron right there. The way that they curve in the magnetic field tells us they're negatively charged particles, and the charge to mass ratio tells us that they're smaller than atoms. In other words, they're subatomic negatively charged particles. Now, we did analyze this chamber over here as well that we sometimes call the acceleration chamber. We don't have to do that that often, but we can. We can do it. The acceleration chamber uh, causes these cathode rays, or as we now know them, electrons, to speed up. That's like a car going down a hill. What kind of energy does the car have at the top of the hill? Potential energy. But this is going to be QV potential, right? not MGH potential. Sometimes there's kinetic at the beginning as well, but in, in this context, it'll always just be potential. And then, of course, it's kinetic at the end. Why didn't Thompson just use this speed right here instead of doing that velocity selection chamber? Venture. Because that's the mask. <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe. Good. That is the maximum possible speed. Maybe the conversion is a little bit less than 100% efficient. Maybe it's not actually going quite that fast. Okay, we don't want how fast it could be going. We want how fast it is going. So. Um, that's why we introduced this velocity selection chamber. That tells us how fast the particles, the Goldilocks particles, the ones that are going at just the right speed, tells us how fast they are going, not how fast they could be going. All right. Let's, uh, let's take a look just real quickly at our physics principles before we move on to checking, all, checking the work that we uh, did on Tuesday here. Um, if I was to analyze... See a problem involving the acceleration chamber. And I was to analyze it this way, EI is equal to EF. Which of the 10 physics principles that are on your data sheet and also posted at the back of the room, which of the 10 physics principles would you use? Good, conservation of energy. Um, that would be principle number five, is it? Yeah, principle number five. Now, somebody this morning when I asked that question said, uh, principle number one, accelerated motion. Now, understand that we did not use principle one to analyze, to analyze the acceleration chamber. We didn't use principle one. But you could use principle one. You could say VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD. But then you'd have to know what A was, so you'd have to use F is equal to M times A. But then you'd have to know what F was, so you'd have to use F is equal to Q times E. And you'd have to know what E was, so probably... E is equal to delta V over delta D. In a roundabout way, you could use principle one to solve for the final speed. So because of that, if they asked you for the physics principle that you used, you could actually say principle one, even though we didn't use principle one. The easier one I would suggest is principle five, because that's what we used, and it's the easier one to use. What physics principle is the velocity selection chamber? I'll give you a hint. It's not principle eight, conservation of nucleons. Considering you don't even know what a nucleon is, it's probably good that it's not principle eight. What is it? Sean, what principle is it? Uh, principle zero. That would be principle zero, Sean. Excellent. Principle zero. Uniform motion. Uh, F net is equal to zero. If you look at the back wall, it says balanced forces, constant velocity, A is equal to zero. They all mean the same thing, right? What about the main chamber here? 
which section of the cathode ray tube, or sorry, which uh, physics principle or principles would that be? What is it? Yeah, that would be principle uh, two, uniform circular motion. Got it? So have you ever had to do, I mean, this would be a perfect um, physics principle problem. The last question on your exam will involve physics principles. In fact, it will involve two of them. I'm not trying to give you any kind of hint whatsoever because I don't know what it's going to look like on your exam. You'll know before I do. Okay? I'm not suggesting to you that you're going to see this question as a physics principle question. I'm just looking at this and saying this is a prototypical physics principle question because it involves more than one. So maybe you end up having to solve for the speed here, sub it into here, and you would be using principle zero and two. Does that make sense? Okay, that last question will be stall for an answer, and then the follow-up question will be which two physics principles did you use to solve for that answer? So this would be a perfect example. Of it. Now, there's a million other perfect examples as well that uh, you see. I'm, to be honest, and those physics principle questions, I'm not sure that we've ever gotten one involving the cathode ray tube. I can't remember. Um, but it's a perfect example. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily the thing you'll see, but the kind of thing that we, tend, that we tend to see. All right, let's take a look at worksheet number 22 now that you, had, uh, that you were working on on Tuesday. I want to do questions 3 and 5 on this worksheet. Number 3 says, calculate the charge-to-mass ratio of a particle. This is what Thompson did, right? found the charge to mass ratio of the particle that passes through a magnetic field and is deflected with this radius, 3.7 times 10 to the minus 3. Which chamber of the cathode ray tube would this be? If we've got just a magnetic field, and this is the part where we want to find the charge to mass ratio, which chamber or which section would it be? Uh, the main chamber. Good. That's going to be the main chamber, where we say... Fc equals Fm. And we know that because there's just a magnetic field, and we also know that because that's where we find the charge to mass ratio. So let's say F, uh, Fc is mv squared over r, Fm is qvb. Cancel that out. Solve for q over m. m goes down by dividing. b goes down by dividing. And this is what we end up getting. All right. Let's sub in our values here. V is 5 times 10 to the 5. Be prepared for that situation where you need to find V from the velocity selection chamber and then sub it into here. Here we're given V, but you could absolutely be asked to solve for V and then sub it into this equation. All right, B is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 2 times 3.7 times 10 to the negative 3. And when we get that, we get 1.88 times 10 to the 9, and it would be 2 ohms per kilogram. Okay, what do you know about this, this particle, whatever this particle is, based on its charge to mass ratio? What do you know that it is? Maybe a better question is, what do you know that it is not? It's not an electron because the charge to mass ratio is too small, right? That means the mass would be too, if the charge to mass is too small, the mass is too big. So it's not an electron. I don't know what it is. Okay, in the end, this would be not technically a cathode ray tube. Uh, we talked about this the other day. This would be technically a mass spectrometer. It works on the same principles, but uses uh, particles that are ions or something that's not electrons. All right, and number five. Five says, five says a cathode ray passes undeflected through an electric field and a magnetic field. What's the kinetic energy of the cathode ray? Don't get caught up in the details like kinetic energy here. Okay, we've seen questions like this, minus the kinetic energy thing. Let's say that if it's undeflected, this is a, uh, which chamber is it? Rachel, which chamber is this if it's undeflected in an electric and magnetic field? 
velocity selection. Good. It's the velocity selection chamber. And in that one, we say Fe is equal to Fm. Remember, we don't pay attention to gravity because it's so small. So Qe is equal to QVB. Qs cancel. V is equal to E over B. And we sub in our values for that, and we get a, a speed here of 714285.7 meters per second. And then what do we do? Then what do we do? We got speed. We want to find kinetic energy. Ethan, then what do we do? Ethan, what is it? One half mv squared. Excellent work, <laughs> Ethan. So we're going to say ek is equal to one half mv squared. We sub our numbers in there, including v. Don't forget to square it. And ek is uh, two point three two times ten to the minus nineteen joules. Good.